Hey, welcome back to TEC Tube. I'm Vince Sylvester, and today we have a really cool topic going over infrared technology. Today I have Dave Taylor with me, and he is the infrared guru. Dave, what are we going to be going over today? Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about how infrared works. We're going to talk about some tips on design. We're going to talk about some of the installation and placement of the infrared units. And we're also going to talk a little bit about how to discuss this with the end user or the building owner. Excellent. So without further ado, we're going to get started. Here we are at our Melrose training lab where we actually have a working infrared. We also hold three hour sessions here throughout the year. What I'm going to do today is explain a little bit about how infrared works so you can explain it to your customer versus standard unit heaters. Standard unit heaters heat up air. That their air has to be then blown across us to heat us up. Infrared works more like the sun. The sun sends its rays down to heat things. Heat you, heat the ground. Those things then heat up and feel warmer. That's one of the big differences in standard unit heaters versus infrared. This above me here is a working infrared heater. Let me just talk a little bit about the components. The tubing you see here is hot rolled steel. The reflectors are aluminum. The burner head contains the inducer. It contains the gas valve, the fanwall control board with a direct spark ignition, a pressure switch, and transformer. Actually, this is just like a small furnace, just with a straight heat exchanger. So there's nothing magical about this infrared heater something that you worked on before and it's very easy to install and service. This is a typical application where you're heating the air. Even in the winter time you're bringing in warm air and heating it up. That could cause other problems. But here the air is stratifying. Even with nozzles on it like this you're actually blowing the air down but it's quickly rising up. So you're not heating the floor, you're not heating the area where the people are at. And that's where infrared comes into play. Now we're going to talk a little bit about designing the system. Remember how we talked about standard unit heaters heat air? Well, you can reduce the amount of heat that you need for a space because of that. If you can get the amount of heat that unit heaters uh, are designed for, you can take a reduction factor of 80% to that standard unit heater. So if you have a unit heater that you're replacing, it's 100,000 BTUs, you can size the burner head for 80,000 BTUs. There's several reasons for that. One is that because it heats air. Two is because of air stratification. And three, infrared heaters heat the floor. So the floor is a reserve heat that re-radiates up into the air and it just heats up to five or six feet. So you don't have to heat the whole area. You just have to heat it to five or six feet. Now when you design a system, if you design a big pole barn or something like that where you bring in large things like combines or tractors, those are cold. You bring them in from minus 10 inside and they're going to be a heat sink. So you have to upsize the burner one or two times depending on the size of the object to account for that until those objects heat up. Now a couple other things. Two-stage heaters or uh, two-stage unit heaters uh, are pretty common. Two-stage infrared is just the opposite. You want to try to stay away from two-stage. Two-stage furnace for example is used just for comfort. But a two-stage infrared is not a good thing because infrared heaters have to be hot to radiate heat. The cooler it is, the less heat that comes out. Imagine the sun on low fire. It's not a good source of heat. So try to stay away from two-stage infrared. Also a couple other things you want to consider about the design is the tubing material. The tubing material can be anywhere from hot rolled steel, which is usually standard, to calorized aluminized steel, to stainless steel. Stainless steel tubing material has a very low emissivity. That means it's not a good transfer of heat. So try to stay away from stainless steel design. The only time I've designed a stainless steel tube is in a copper sludge plant. They were using very nasty chemicals to pull out the copper and there the tubing material, the burner head, and the reflectors were all stainless steel. But I had to go up two to three sizes on the burner head and it's also about two and a half times more expensive. So stay away from stainless steel. Car washes are fine. You can uh, just do regular uh, hot roll steel for uh, car washes 
or you can also do uh, aluminum reflectors. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about in the design is the AFU. Everybody always asks me what the AFU is. Well, there is no standard yet for AFU. They're developing one, but right now there is no standard for AFU. In actuality, it's between 83 and 85 percent because you don't want condensation in the tube, you don't want water in the tube, that's not good for it. But if somebody asks you what the AFU is, the efficiency, it's about 83 to 85 percent. A little bit more about the design and the placement of the units themselves. There's a rule of thumb in the placement of units as to know how high you place them. And the rule of thumb is one foot high means two foot wide for the spread of the infrared light. Now, this unit itself is about 10 feet high, which means the spread of the rays are going to be 10 feet this side and 10 feet that side. So if I hang unit 20 feet high, that would be 40 feet each side, correct? Anything over 20 feet, you have to derate the unit about 1% per foot. So you may have to upsize the burner head. And if it's over 60 feet, then you should speak to us and we'll have to talk to the manufacturer to derate the units. The only thing I can think of that 60 feet is could be an airplane hanger where you have to have at least 10 feet between the burner head and the nearest point that it could be touching. The other thing you don't have to be concerned about is where the burner head ends here. Like a fluorescent light, you can still see, and you don't have to be right underneath the fluorescent light. Well, rays come off like this, too. So I don't have to have the end of the unit or the burner head be right over where I need to heat. I can have a little bit of space in between there. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is the heat fall off. This unit, all burner head units, are about 850 to 900 degrees right at the burner head. If I have a tube length of 60, 70, 80 feet, it's going to be a lot cooler down there, probably around 350 degrees at the end. So when you place the burner head, place it nearest to the point of the greatest heat loss. That could be an exterior wall, it could be a door, it could be an overhead door, but place it where the heat loss is the greatest. The other factor you have to consider is the clearance to combustibles. Now, every manufacturer has different clearance to combustibles, but this one, I'm probably three and a half feet from the burner tube. The clearance to combustibles is a critical dimension that you have to be careful of because you can't have anything closer than that clearance to combustibles. And it could be anywhere from three feet to five feet, depending on the burner head. Now, what happens if you have some things close to that, they're not gonna light on fire. But if you have people, or if you have uh, plastic and shrink wrap, that may start to melt or start to disintegrate at that point. So be careful when you place these units, ask where the clearance to combustibles becomes a factor. It could be in a service bay where you have lifts. You can't have the car paint be close to the clearance to combustibles. Let's talk a little bit about venting. This is a positive pressure system, which means the inducer is at the burner head and it pushes air through it. There's also a negative pressure systems with the inducer at the end and it draws air through it. This happens to be a vertical vent, but you can do horizontal venting also. You need to check with your local codes for the requirements for both vertical and horizontal venting. You can also have common venting too. I could have two going into one common vertical or horizontal vent. These are four inch, the common vent would have to be six inch. If you have four going into one, then it would be eight inch. Also, if you have common venting, they have to be on the same thermostat too. Now also, you can have combustion air brought in from the outside. You don't need to. Most applications just bring in room air, but you can also bring in combustion air from the outside. You have to be careful though, every manufacturer has different vent links, so you have to look on their tables for the different vent links because you can only have so much vent links, just like in a regular furnace. Also, if you bring in outside air, you meet certain utility requirements. Check with your local utility as to what the uh, rebate is for um, infrared systems. Now, along with the payback uh, program that we have, most of the time with the rebates, the payback is usually less than two years. But again, check with your local utility as far as the paybacks. The other thing is the energy savings. Uh, most of the manufacturers say between 30 and 50 percent energy savings. There was an ASHRAE study out there that
looked at one example that because the infrared heater heated the ground, you could put the thermostat at the level where people are. And you could save 30 to 50 percent because you didn't have to worry about air stratification and overheating air in areas that you don't need. So that is an ASHRAE study. Let me summarize again. We'll be happy to provide tools for you, whether to do load estimates or payback studies. We'll be happy to come out to a job. Please see your TECTM or you can contact me directly and we can help you with some designs. Dave, thank you so much for coming out, telling us all about infrared technology, but can I get one for my garage? Well, actually, Vince, there are uh, garage applications and there are also patio application units that we can talk to you about. We also have a design tool that will help you do load estimates and show uh, payback analysis. Uh, we'd also be happy to come out to the job site with you. Just uh, see your TECTM or contact me. Awesome. Thanks again for watching. Uh, please comment below if there's anything that you would like to see in the future. We'd love to hear it. So we'll see you next time. Thank you.